Wisdom is, it's, it's more than knowledge. You know, you know something. But you can, be, you can know it and just be dumber than a post as far as the application of what you know. You understand that. I, the older I get, the more, more I'm, I realize how dumb a human can be by watching myself, <laughs> how dumb I can be. But you have knowledge. But it has to start there. If you don't know, you know, you walk around without any knowledge. That's not, but once you get knowledge, then you need to have some wisdom. You, you need to have the ability to take that knowledge and then apply it where it needs to be pli applied in the most appropriate way. Prudence is a step beyond that. Wisdom is understanding of the, of the, of the ultimate issues. But prudence is a discernment of the needs and, and, and the, the, the way something is applied and how it's going to affect, not just right now, but the, the future and the ultimate. Prudence sees the big picture. Wisdom fixes the issue now and takes care of the, of the problem as it is right here. Knows how to apply knowledge to solve the problem now. Prudence looks beyond the now and sees the, the bigger picture and how it fits into that. And the way God has fixed things is so that you and I can think like he thinks. And he's abounded toward us in this wisdom and prudence. We have been entrusted with the will and the wisdom and the prudence of God. Now that's, to me, that's a staggering thing. He didn't make his grace abound to us in a random, haphazard way, but in a carefully regulated manner. That's what verse 9, verse 10, there's a plan involved. If you go back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, here's a verse that from my youngest Christian life has excited me. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6 when he talks about this advanced information that Ephesians is going to talk to us about, verse 6, how bit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world which come to naught. Notice we're going to talk about the wisdom of God. He's lavished upon us his wisdom and his prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will. Paul says, I've got some wisdom to talk to you about. Verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Now all of a sudden we're in Ephesians 1 verse 9. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Here's some wisdom God had before the foundation of the world which none of the princes of this world knew for had they known it they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now look how, look at that wisdom. The conflict between God and Satan has always been about wisdom. And God say the, the boast of the adversary, Ezekiel 28, they say his, his admirers say about Lucifer before he became Satan that he's, he's wise. The text back there says he's wiser than Daniel. He's the sum of beauty, perfect in wisdom. And the text back there in Ezekiel 28 says there's no secret they can keep from him. So when he became the adversary of God developed his own way of doing things. He was perfect until iniquity was found in him. When he developed the plan the Bible calls iniquity, iniquity is a word inherently means crooked, perverse. The plan, listen, the spirit of autonomy and rebellion against God originated with the adversary. It didn't originate with your teenagers. It didn't originate with you when you were a teenager. You know, I, some parents recently were talking about their teenage, one of their teenagers and some of the things they were doing that they were a little upset about. And he looked at his wife and said, well, <laughs> I remember what I was doing his age and he doing that. I remember what you were doing when his age, he, 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 he was your age, and he isn't doing that. So whatever problems we got, they weren't bad as, you know. 
So mom and dad, listen, I don't, you, you teenagers close your ears just a minute, but mom and dad, you have to remember you know, some of that. And you say, well, but I didn't do any of that. Yeah, but you would have if you'd have had the chance, wouldn't you? I, and I met a lot. It's not my notes. This is just all free right now. The greatest definition of sin in the Bible is Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone into our own way. We're going to do it our way. Romans 1 says that's the lie program. Worship and serve the creature more than the creator. That's the lie. Take the truth of God and turn it into a lie. I'm going to be God. No, you aren't. That's what Lucifer said. And every time you buy into that attitude, you buy into the lie program originated on the drawing board of Satan. And he said, I'm the one that's smart enough. I'm the one who has the intelligence enough. I'm the one with the wisdom to run the universe. And Paul says, you know, God had a plan to really demonstrate his wisdom. When Satan did that, he didn't whack him right down. You know what Romans, says about, what Romans 1 says about man when they didn't want to have God in their knowledge? He said he gave them up. Go and do it your way. See what happens. How's, what it gets you. And God had a plan. And verse 8 says that he had a, a, a secret purpose in his son that none of the princes of the world knew, for had they known it, they wouldn't have done the one thing that made it possible, crucified the Lord of glory. That's why Colossians 2.15 says that Jesus Christ made an open show of Satan and all of his hosts at Calvary, made an open show, made a public humiliation of them, triumphing over them on the cross. You say, but I look at the cross and it looks like God is being defeated. Oh, but you didn't hear the rest of the story. You didn't hear the end of it. It looked that way, but looks, circumstances, the moment can be deceiving. You see, wisdom sees more than the moment. Prudence sees the whole picture. And the wisdom of God was that through that cross, everything God is ever going to accomplish is, is, is based upon what Jesus did at Calvary. And who is it that crucified the Lord of glory? It was Satan and his philosophy. Satan and his approach. It was the cruelty and wickedness of sin. And you see God himself submitting himself to our hatred, our sinfulness, our rebellion, and all of its fruits. And in it you see his wisdom. That's why he says back in chapter 1 of Ephesians, that it's in the riches of his grace that he's abounded toward us. Grace is all that God is free to do for you through the finished work of Christ. And it's out of that Calvary work, out of that cross work, that all of this glory springs, bursts forth, lavishly bestowed, abounds. You follow that? You've got to get that. Because we're going to move into Ephesians 1, verse 8 and 9. We're going to move into all these uh, abound, th this, this, this wisdom of God and the details of it. And listen, it's so wonderful, I'll get lost in it. I, I guarantee you. I said, said, it's going to be to the end of the year, I bet you. I'm not, well, dollars against donut holes. What is this? October, it'll be, in, it will be next year getting out of this passage. Because it's so exciting. And I can't help it. I just get excited about it. But it all is based on the cross. And that's why verse 7 is where it is. That's why verse 6 and 7, he starts out talking about the big scope, then he goes back to the cross. And then it says, because it's out of the cross, all this stuff comes. God has abounded toward us in wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will. His wisdom, his prudence... His plan has been lavished upon us. We've been entrusted with his thinking. That, in turn, affects the way we think. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, we have the mind of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean he bore a hole inside your head and stuck his brain in you. 
It means he's given you his mindset, his thinking in that book. Folks, that's why we're people of a book. That's why the book's so important to us. Because it's out of God's Word that that information, there is his mind. That's why the right division of his Word is so critical. It affects how we look at things. So how do you look at things? Do you crumble up? Because you're standing in your own flesh? I mean, are you struggling with, with, with the, 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 the feelings of your own, your own feelings and the shifting sands of circumstances? Are you only happy and rejoicing in the Lord when things are going your way? Or do you look at things from God's vantage point? Well, see, that's the key. Growth and transformation. Now, that's what's coming. We're going to grow in some understanding. When you grow in understanding, that growth is designed to transform your life. And the Christian life, the path for those who know the Lord Jesus Christ, is, is, is simply one of growing and being transformed by that growth. You grow in a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not so that you've got a bunch of head knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, Paul says to the Corinthians, but charity edifies. Isn't that what you want? Don't you want the edification? Charity isn't just knowing. It is knowing. But charity has to do with taking what you know and having it become the labor of love. The act, having it begin to activate your life. Far too often, far too many of us are stymied in our lives. We want to grow. We want to change. Yet we never seem to grow up. We never seem to get with the program. <laughs> That's not a new phenomenon. You, 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 we were in Corinthians. If you're still there, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It isn't new that this happens. This is something that Paul, you know, we talk about all the time because Paul talks about it all the time. 1 Corinthians 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Notice there are three different kind of people there. They're spiritual believers. That's the mature believer walking in the understanding, growing, and being transformed by what he knows. Then there are carnal believers. Carnal, the word carnal is the word flesh, dominated by his flesh, by his human thinking, minding the things of the old life. Then there's a babe in Christ. You know, if a babe in Christ, he's somebody just been saved a little while. He doesn't know a whole lot. The problem with the carnal believer is he, he, he looks and acts like a baby, although he ought not be. So you've got two positions there that are fine, the spiritual man and the babe in Christ. If a babe in Christ, if a baby poops his diaper, do you get mad at him? No, what do you do? <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> and you change it, you know. Or you take him to mama and let her change him. If a baby cries when he, when, when he gets hungry, do you say, why don't you shut up and wait your turn? No. You get the form, you, 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 you feed them. Because that's, that's what babies do. But if you're 30 years old and you're still pooping your diapers and crying for somebody to feed you, nobody's going to be that sympathetic with you. They're going to say, grow up. That's right. I've fed you with milk. Who do you feed with milk? Babies, and not meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able, for ye are yet carnal. You see, the carnal believer is still drinking milk when he ought to be able to eat meat. There's a growth process here. And he hasn't gotten on with the growing process. You can't live on milk forever. Cows don't live on milk forever. A cow weans her calf off of the milk quite early because of the milk industry. We don't do it till we're about 50 or 60 or 70 years old. But, you know, by the time you're 18 years old, you ought to be weaned off of it. 
I mean, folks, you, you, spiritually speaking, you need to grow up. And when you grow up, you move on to maturity. You grow in grace, and you're transformed by that knowledge. And you learn what Paul learned in Romans 7. It's not I, it's Christ. Christ. 